Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Black Church Studies Alumni Lecture. I'm so glad that you came out here tonight. Some of you made the sacrifice of coming out and not going trick-or-treating. So <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate your time tonight. So it's nice and wonderful opportunity to learn and to grow and to be in community together. And we are blessed to have an incredible scholar, a wonderful individual, Dr. Cleve Tinsley. Dr. Cleve Tinsley IV. Let me make sure I always state that. Yeah, I am not my father. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so he earned his MDiv from Princeton in 2007. In addition, he earned his MA and PhD in religion from Rice University. His dissertation, Making Black Lives Matter, Race, Religion, and Struggles for African American Identity, explores the ongoing relationship between religion and black freedom struggles. In it, he theorizes African American religious struggle, arguing that understanding the significance and meaning of black religion in the U.S. requires more extensive sociological research strategies given the complex nature of religious meaning making in the lives of African Americans today. Dr. Tinsley currently works both as postdoctoral research affiliate with the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning and the Visiting Research Fellow in the Religion and Public Life Program at Rice. In addition to his responsibilities with these research groups, is also working to update his thesis for his first manuscript. In addition, he works with Project Curate, which is an incredible organization in Houston, Texas that does amazing things around race and conversations related to solidarity and even language. In addition, he is very pastoral. He is currently a theologian in residence at St. John's United Methodist Church downtown in Houston, Texas, and has been on associate pastor at a number of great churches throughout the country. But what's most important for me personally that he is very pastoral and very prophetic and very kind. I remember our first encounter here mm -hmm. right in front of Stuart, there was a bench and it was after Hebrew, summer Hebrew, summer language. Mm -hmm. And I came from Brooklyn with my white tees and headbands on and I was a little odd character for Princeton, to say the least. <laughs> and I remember after bombing my second Hebrew test, so there is hope, right? <laughs> and feeling like, God, why am I here? And then Cleve and his pastoral manner, he came to me, sat beside me, and we had a wonderful conversation, which was the beginning of many conversations that not only kept me from going back to Houston, let me go by. I should have been in Houston, but that's another story. <laughs> I was ready to go back to Brooklyn. But through that friendship, it helped to inspire me to not only be the best me that I could be, mm -hmm. but also to pursue PhD and make sure that we connect our research with what goes on in our communities, particularly with the lives of black people. Mm -hmm. And so I am forever indebted and grateful to God for his life and his example. And tonight he's going to just give us some of his excellence, his acumen, and his heart. And so I would like to introduce to all of us Dr. Cleve Tinsley IV. So thanks first for having me. Um, it's an, uh, a great honor to not only be here with, with you, um, some of you who are African American students, but also the larger constituency here at Princeton Seminary, but also it's uh, quite meaningful to be back here as a friend of Kermit Moss, um, listening to his introduction to me, I wanted to clap for whoever that person was, right? Um, but I'm been grateful to be to be uh, in relationship with Kermit over all these years, and I'm so excited for all the great work that he's doing here at Princeton, his research, um, and everything that happens. And so it's an honor. It's an honor to kind of be back here. I haven't been here back here in about eight years or so, and so it's a esteemed privilege to share with you. Uh, some, not only some of my own research, but also my own thinking around theological education and kind of where you are right now and how they may, might intersect with your future and pas passional interests you have going forward. Um, now, the slide that you see up right now is from a presentation I did at a conference recently. Uh, it is not the subject matter of my talk explicitly. However, it does show the type of uh, collaborative work that I intend I do. The person who prepared this slide and the rest of the photos is my partner and spouse, Lanicia Rouse Tinsley, who's a photographer and also a multidisciplinary artist. And for my own dissertation and manuscript project, uh, when I was doing my own field work and interviews, she also captured images of everybody, and I use it in my theorizing about black religion, which I'll talk about a bit later on. 
Also, another artist um, who prepares these for me is another guy named Chap Edmondson, another member of our team. Uh, Kermit mentioned Project Curate. It is the mechanism through which I still engage in community engagement and church work, and I talk about uh, how that has been instantiated and why that came about. Uh, but tonight I want to talk about um, alienation, specifically overcoming alienation in theological education, and specifically how that applies to African American students in particular, but also any students of color uh, more generally. I've entitled tonight, tonight's talk, Black Matter or Black Matters, Revisiting the Problem of Alienation in Theological Education. I also put in quotes when I was thinking about this, religious studies as well, which is my home discipline. If I would have been thinking, I would have asked Kermit to share with you all, at least email to whatever the situ was, this essay by Dr. Peter Paris. It arises out of my engagement with him. Peter Paris, as many of you may know already, is the emeritus professor of social ethics here at Princeton Theological Seminary, but he also was, uh, well, still is a dear mentor of mine. He was just here last night, as a matter of fact. And um, I did my senior thesis with him when I was a div student here, thinking about the relationship between Christianity and, uh, well, really social ethics and also pragmatism, thinking about the, the pragmatic utility of what I thought of as my black Christian faith at the time. While researching for that, um, that work, I came across his essay, 1991 essay about overcoming alienation, and it was a look back. It was 1991, but he was looking back at the civil rights era and uh, its type of moral implications for theological education today, or rather in the 90s. And it's only about seven, eight years later or so that I revisited that and thinking about coming here and I found uh, myself kind of realizing that it still resonates with me as a type of thinking about my own uh, formation and education and religious studies and theologically, but also what it means for me as a minister and also a critical theorist of religion. But I'll talk about it, all that stuff as I go throughout this talk today. I realized today that uh, I wrote a lot, but I'm more interested really in engaging with you a bit, so I'll make sure I'll leave time uh, for that. So I'll read as much as I can until I get tired of hearing myself talk. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll try to engage with you if that's, if that's cool, all right? Now, I'm also an ordained Baptist preacher, so I, I believe in talk back. I'm at a seminary. It's cool. Um, so don't feel like you have to be muffled at all, right? Feel free to even stop me if you have a question in, in the middle of it. There are no, no strict orders and rules, and there are reasons for that, and I'll talk about that as I go through that. So let me just begin here. Black Matters or Black Matter. Revisiting the Problem of Alienation in Theological and Religious Studies. I approach this subject not only as a critical theorist of religion, uh, a pretty critical theorist of religion and black liberation struggle, but also as an ambivalent practitioner. I am what many would refer to as a recovering black evangelical and still a practicing and ordained Baptist clergyman who, whenever possible, deploys the best of this formation's prophetic tradition in engagement with a variety of publics, something I'll visit later on at the end of my talk. I also hope tonight, though, to get to the significance of both the abstract and material significance of my play on black matter or black mattering. It is both uh, critical and abstract and concrete ways. And that only marks, and I'll not only comment in my former remarks, but I hope through further discussion I'll talk about its relationship to thinking about embodiment or incarnation as uh, we come to think of it here in theological studies. As I mentioned, the thoughts I share tonight result from my reading, or really a rereading, of Paris's 1991 essay, Overcoming Alienation in Theological Education. Please follow this talk up by reading that essay. Uh, it was first published in an edited volume, Shifting Boundaries, Contextual Approaches to the Structure of Theological Education. In this essay, pa Paris argues that, the need, that there is a need to address the disaffection with predominantly white seminaries and divinity schools by students of color in general and of African American students in particular, especially when it comes to their curricula and the training. These institutions should work harder, Paris contends, to cultivate an ap academic ethos in which there is, quote, a heightened sensitivity and genuine responsiveness to the concerns of historically oppressed peoples, close quote. In the end, Paris makes a compelling argument about how we need to rethink the structure of theological, er af theological education for African Americans. We need to employ a more expansive approach that not only facilitates bringing African American, African and African American studies to the center of our curricula, 
for instance. But we also need a wider critical engagement or wider discourses in the humanities and social sciences. In short, Paris suggests that there needs to be a more conservative effort to push to establish a relationship between the seminary and the university, metaphorically speaking. Doing so will not only make for a more robust training and thinker for black, future black, black ministers, community leaders, and professors, but students in these wider disciplines, meaning in these universities and spaces, will also be challenged to develop more sophisticated analyses of and responses to the types of normative questions, questions about cultural meaning and identity, about how to account for the great mix of tragic and comic, uh, cosmic comic, uh, circumstances of one's birth and history with which theological students from historically oppressed groups have always grappled with in concrete ways. Undergirding what Paris puts forth in this essay about a new dialogical paradigm between the university and seminary are virtues of justice, of peace, and of an appreciation for the integrity of human difference, or as he terms it, the integrity of God's creation. All values following from what, are the, what were the central concerns of what Paris says was the World Council of Churches. Tonight, I'll adjust these core values in what I'll present and focus on issues, yes, still of justice, of solidarity, but also want to add an element of creativity or innovation as a guiding principle. And I think a concurrent of these three should configure a struggle to establish an equality of metaphors, of images, of meaning in our theologies, which better shape, in my view, the enormous depth and complexity of human struggle in modern life. It will not only take basic commitments to love and justice and solidarity, but again, to innovation, I argue, if the future of theological education is to provide a more holistic vision for enacting the types of expansive and dynamic love which the divine commends for us. I'll extend Paris's dialogical model of theological education to a triangular one, while also suggesting that our churches, too, must also seek to reform its approaches and community engagement in order to receive the types of transformative leaders that will be trained by this new triangular method of education. But before doing so, let me back up and provide some context for my remarks. Paris's essay stirred in me, or at least challenged me, to rethink the social climate in which today's theological education occurs. My own community engagement and my own scholarship has emerged in today's climate, and Paris's analysis still resonates. Questions still abound. What are the moral demands of today's social climate to our theological education? What are some of the tensions within and challenges to black churches, specifically, if we can use that moniker, in view of today's black consciousness movements and other movements of social change? How do these movements differ from what Paris observed in the 50s and 60s black America? And what are the effects on faculties, administrators, and on students today in theological education? Paris's analysis has as a backdrop many of the social movements that marked what some refer to as a shift in American society. In fact, you can look at these as cultural to touch points of a new modernity in America, oppressed groups of colors, blacks and white feminists, womanists, and LGBTQ activists began pressing for more inclusion and diversity in our cultural representations. Now, most thinking about this black, the black movements in this area tend to focus on the civil rights and in some case, the black power movements, most prominently on what Martin and Malcolm, as two representative religious exemplars. But they often fail to esteem the meaningful and stalwart work of folks like Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, Elaine Brown, and many others. Nonetheless, as Paris notes, the civil rights era consciousness did have a profound effect on many. It would transform the moral sensibilities of many social actors, sparking a new verve and commitments to its strategies and goal of making racial justice a reality. As Paris goes on to note, however, the new moral demands set by the times would not be limited just to greater so society. Many seminaries and divinity schools would respond positively to these demands. And most of us in this room, especially those of color, would be direct beneficiaries of some of, these, some of this pressing. Financial assistance programs became available. A need to increase black enrollment would become the priority for many of these schools. 
And many of us would not be able to come if some of the financial benefits of defraying the calls, which would have been insurmountable for some of us to kind of be here. Now, recently there was, uh, I understand, reparations remarked by Princeton Seminary. I know there's some dissatisfaction around it. Um, but I can say as one that still owes around $15,000, keep on pushing. I'm with you, all right? Um, but it did just stop here. Students, like many of you in this room tonight, in these schools also pressed their institutions as well. They demanded for more inclusion of the black experience in the curriculum. And along with that came the implicit demand for the hiring of more competent African-American faculty. Institutional responses to these demands took the form of what we most see today uh, tonight even in the form of special lectures on black concerns. Every now and then there was a special conference. Most often times these things were often organized by black students or the few black faculty that advocated for them. And there also has been optional elective courses to the main curriculum. And judging from what we observe today, not much has changed in 30 years. Our theological institutions are still slow to make full-time appointments to faculty of color and we see very few senior level appointments or appointments aligned with the humanities and social sciences. For instance, every now and then in our faculty of divinity schools and seminaries, we might see hires in practical theology, but they're slower to make uh, appointments in other disciplines within the humanities. Now, there have been some recent folks who have been here, for instance. I'm reminded of Dr. Yolanda Pierce, who was here uh, with English and African American studies, and even now, Dr. Kerry Day. But when these appointments are made, it's revealing how many of these faculties have had to leave for other institutions for promotion or just their peace of mind. And many feel they are forced to leave academia altogether. Cite here Christina Cleveland at Duke Divinity School. We can talk more about this later if you like. We see then still at work even what Dr. Parrish noted long ago, that relatively few institutions establish special chairs in black studies. And when it comes to addressing the felt needs and curricular concerns of their black students, most of these predominantly white seminaries and divinity schools would prefer to appoint faculty or those who will be laden with a barrage of other administrative duties so they wouldn't be promoted with tenure. They also have a whole bunch of teaching responsibilities. And what we see here, in, in fact, the pressures of finishing programs, in addition to the strict requirements of uh, PhD study, just like Kermit, my friend, many are appointed as interim, as ways to avoid the real um, task of appointing someone of tenure. These folks are often undercompensated, and their, their service is not credited to one type of tenure portfolio or professorial portfolio. Like Kermit said to me earlier today, at least I can have it on my CV. And so what Paris ascertained long ago still rings true today, upon careful scrutiny. By and large, white theological seminaries and divinity schools have become all the more complacent and seem, as Paris still contended long ago, that they are concerned with little more than making small concessions to the demands, not of this era, but of a previous era. Still, we've not seen widespread change in the curricula, and even at schools that do have established curricula in black church studies, like Duke and like here, it doesn't appear that our senior faculty has the most robust support when it comes to making these lasting impacts. The moral influence of what we refer to tonight as a civil right era of black freedom struggle would also impact those of us in the classroom and other words worth, ways worth commenting on. As Paris highlighted, seminaries and divinity schools could not have predicted the emergence of a new emergent critical constructive scholarship of black and womanist theology. It was here that for the first time in the history of academe, African Americans would have a subject matter and a methodological perspective that was, quote, peculiarly their own and capable of rigorous academic defense, close quote, according to Paris. Now, it's still worth noting, as Paris did, that like all scholarship, theological scholarship can be subject still to the colonial ways of viewing knowledge. Both in its content and its method, it can often reproduce the virulent status quo groupthink of which we could al should always be wary. It's why critical exchange, say, between Cone's black liberation theology and Dolores Williams' womanist theology and Sisters in the Wilderness is needed. Sloan himself admitted to certain blind spots and Dolores Williams talks about and situates uh, black women's experiences of, of oppression within that framework Cone tried to outlay. 
This is not only so because this is a need for more obvious intersectional analysis in the black community, but also as Cone admitted later, we all have these kind of blind spots. Though Cone's theology was innovated, first starting with Black Theology and Black Power in 1968, uh, his text Black Theology of Liberation is still subject to critique. critique. Cone's own neo-orthodoxy and method of correlation he borrowed from Tillich was still tantamount to erecting a house using the master's tools. Nonetheless, these efforts by these earlier critical thinkers and innovators paved the way for us. They were a prophetic practice in scholarship, which critiqued and provided powerful moral challenges to the teaching and writing of their white colleagues. Ironically, as Paris noted, most of this all took place within the confines of white theological institutions. As black professors did their research and their writing while on these faculties on sabbaticals and presented here, in this way, it was not inauthentic. It was a reform movement from within an institution. The Black theological movement as a prophetic force also, though, Paris notes, had an ambiguous relationship with the church and the church's practitioners. On the one hand, it issued a challenge to African-American churches that had a long history of political quietism. On the other, it did serve to condemn the theology of white churches that it claimed had long reinforced the social structure of racial injustice. Yet by and large, we saw that with the, exception, with the exception of a few, the churches and leaders in the black community who most resonated with these new theological movements were the more militant blacks who were part of white denominational structures, i.e. Presbyterianism, United Methodist churches, Episcopals, and on. And also these messages would, would resonate with white liberals who considered themselves to be progressive thinkers. If we can remember, even King suggested that not many sided on his side. King was one of the fortunate few in the 50s who was able to have a liberal white theological education at Crozer Divinity Schools. And so if we kind of recap Paris's main arguments here, there are three things at work that is worth our careful attention. There were tectonic shifts that took place in large society, which had profound moral implications for theological and divinity schools. Students of these institutions demanded more representation in their curricula and faculty. Faculty, responding to the times, began to innovate and produce new perspectives and knowledge productions in accord with the grievances of their communities. This great swell of momentum, prompted by the civil rights era of black consciousness, pushed at least small concessions that we still observe in our context today. And many of us still strive to at least maintain the small progresses that we see. But there still left questions for me when I read this essay. What are today's moral demands? Given my own reflection on my own doctoral training, beginning, during, and the eventual apex of a new era of black consciousness, what moral responsibility should I have, not only as a practitioner, but also as a scholar thinking at the intersection of religion and black freedom struggle? I began my training for doctoral work in 2011, 2012, and during my second semester, Trayvon Martin happened. By the time I finished my comps in 2015 in my own city, uh, another issue happened as well, Sandra Bland. And so what we see now is another shift and backlash, even to the political climate in our elected offices there has been a backlash or a response to what many might argue at least was a symbolic representation of progress with the election of Barack Obama. It's not coincidental that this movement for black lives arose during his presidency. In the streets of many national, in, in many areas, national and local activists have taken on new tactics, new strategies for political resistance. Social media has now been a useful tool for making visible to those around the world in the various, the various ways that the greater specter and power of whiteness in the U.S. has enforced a long-standing policy to keep black bodies, black matter, under its thumb. No longer are this group of new millennial activists who arose willing to center the charismatic leadership of one central figure, namely men. And though they would try, figures like Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and Farrakhan could no and Farrakhan, folks like that, could never longer stand as the cultural representatives for the most active of these new black advocates. More, more keenly away from the subtle ways that a black bodies matters 
have been controlled in America, there was a rejection of these outward cultural tropes of respectability. No longer did it matter, matter to these young activists how we dressed anymore. No matter how passive one it was in their nonviolent strategy, these new generation of activists showed that blackness and black social life would always be denigrated in some way. We also saw a shift in this new epic, this new mat movement for black lives era of consciousness, a shift in organizing centers. Unlike in the civil rights era, black churches and black mosques were no longer the cultural arbiters and glaring representation for black political meaning and struggle. One saw that activists and community organizers began to revitalize traditional African, African religious rituals where they found it useful. And many activists doubt, disavowed religion altogether or some expressed some type of agnosticism. I found myself during this time in an existential intellectual quandary. Here I was grappling with fundamental questions about black religious meaning and social life, utilizing these same tools of rest and scholarship. While I saw on the ground many of my friends and activists committed to, and committed black Christians as well on the front lines, voicing their pain locally there in Houston. I decided that my scholarship had to engage this social activism orientation. It had to take seriously the complexes, the complexities that exist vis-a-vis -vis religion as they arose in questions of black freedom struggle. I did so first by observation. It just so happened by this time I was in my field work stage of my uh, dissertation work. And so I, by observation, I discovered that I can employ, and while doing so, I discovered that I can employ my own organizing and strategic leadership capacity behind the scenes. Much of this capacity was shaped by years of exp my own experience in the black church context. And I would seek ways to negotiate and leverage my access, both to academic and religious institutions, to support collaborative efforts, or at least coalition with young activists and artists by providing spaces for them to meet, two, provide some convenings on which they can contribute, and three, see if I can provide some kind of infrastructure within which they can su sustain their passion and movement. On college campuses and divinity schools across the country, however, we saw die-ins. We saw young students again demanding administrations, demanding that administrations reflect their black concerns in curricula and faculty hires. In other words, things seem to circulate back over again. It's not 30 years ago. Now it's the 2000s. In the Black Lives Matter movement, we see affected the same three triads that Terrace talks about. Communities are expressing their disconcern. Students are expressing their disaffection again. And what's the responsibility of those of us on the intersection of scholarship, of church leadership, of community leadership to do what needs to be done? In fact, now we even see on many college campuses and courses uh, that there are special courses on Black Lives Matter and God and Black Lives Matter, trying to get the relationship between religion, God, and Black Lives Matter, where faculties and are teasing out the moral implications that this black social movement has for their scholarship. As I see it, this calls afresh for theological and religious studies scholarship to bring us a bit further. We need to bring critique to bear on the controlling knowledge structures, which in their own way seek to snuff out black life. But even our black and womanist theology must find ways to make central their analysis to notions of embodiment, notions of incarnation, if you prefer. How does the movement of black bodies in late modern capitalist orders need to reflect through what we teach, what we study, and how we practice ministry? Now, shout out here uh, is due to other theorists, amazing scholars like Ebony Marshall Terman, who's now at Yale, who provided a, a, a brilliant study toward a woman's ethic of incarnation, talking about black bodies in the black church. Shout out as well to the, our own Dr. Kerry Day, who provides an amazing black and womanist critique in, re in regards to neoliberal capitalist orders right now. These texts need to be read by everyone in this room and not as just some addenda to the main systematic theology that you learn in your classrooms. Here, black mattering is not only a philosophical commitment and proposition, but a concrete enfleshment out of which our theorizing or our theological thinking becomes more precise. And although these studies are not necessarily new, we saw that there are more conservative efforts by scholars today 
to merge religious studies, theological studies with black critical thought and embodiment discourses in ways that lay poignantly challenges at the feet of modern scholarship. Here are mindful of texts like Ashawn Crowley's uh, Black Pentecostal Breath, Joseph Winters, Hope Draped in Black, all of these texts either explicitly or implicitly repulled from what I'll refer to as a black material type of thinking. In view of black social life and black struggle, these theorists have began to look at the interstices, at the places in between these arrangements and discourses and divisions and disciplinary procedures to see where true black study can emerge, maybe on the playground, sometimes in the classrooms, to have us think in different ways. Here, English scholars have become important. Theorists like Sadia Hartman, Fred Moden, Fred Wildenson, Sylvia Winter, thinking about Afro-pessimism, folks thinking about mysticism and black flesh. All these perspectives need engagement, not just by scholars, but I would argue by practitioners as well. For my own self, I began thinking with these scholars, bringing them in conversation with black religious thought, uh, even in the own manuscript I'm trying to develop right now, theorizing the nature of black religious struggle from a perspective of social death. Utilizing these theories, I named along with other classical analysis like Orlando Patterson, it sought to discover the entanglement, entanglement of making black lives matter with black matter, meaning in what ways can black materiality shape the content and meaning of our thinking and theologizing, our religious studies, whether it be theology, social theory, ethnography, and other methods in social sciences, my argument is that Blackness itself is a fugitive category. It can't be housed or disciplined by any one category, and we should use many source materials for our theological thinking. And as I ventured back into thinking about the implications for Black Lives Matter, the site of studies for theology and practice, in my own way, I began to think about Paris's stirring essay. In many ways, I'm grateful to Paris because he enabled me to combine my earlier theological thinking and church service work with a broader analysis as a humanist scholar. But I'll come back to this a bit later on. But also of notice, important to note that your tactics have changed as well as divinity students. I've observed from a distance, for instance, how the ABS constituency here has sought to hold both, to both hold power accountable and at bay, calling for explicit acknowledgement of the harm done to black communities of the past here at the seminary. Though it seems to be some dis dissatisfaction with the results, I am pleased at least to see that this seminary started by acknowledging something, along with another flagship Episcopal seminary, Virginia Theological Seminary. To my knowledge, these are the only two seminaries that acknowledged they needed to do something and to do some kind of represent, uh, restitution. Now, as a former co-moderator of Association of Black Seminaries myself, I would like to see other efforts go at work at play. For instance, I have not seen many political pushes for the seminary workers who are here, those who are in the cafeteria. But I'm mindful. We got to take it a step at a time. And the report, the audit, at least by the video I saw, says that there were no slave labor, per se, but former presidents and faculty did have black slaves themselves. So what if we were to start with the center of there? What if we did a reflection in our theological studies and our courses, starting from the fact that black bodies have not only not matter, but have been matter upon which all of our theological education has progressed? The struggle for students in our seminary divinity schools to overcome alienation then still continues, especially for African American students. Just like Paris diagnosed long ago, black studies of which black and women's theological studies are a crucial part, have still been marginalized in the master curricula. I was grateful that I was able to experience, while at my time here, a different kind of dialogical model that Paris put forth. I was grateful for the opportunity to, have ex to expand my exposure to courses over at the university. Shout out to Professor Blunt, who was here at the time, Mark Taylor, who employed his own critical race studies and theories to his own theology. If it were not for him, I probably would not have been doing doctoral work myself, for it was through his second semester of systematic theology that I was first introduced to God of the oppressed. It was only after I left later that I realized many students of color at seminaries never experience firsthand accounts of our own types of literature. 
And my argument tonight, much like Paris's was, is that we still must struggle in these settings to overcome our alienations through our own type of innovation. Our communities depend on it. Your future as leaders are entangled with this effort and you must find forms of life in death dealing environments which can especially be pernicious when cloaked in mystical types of God talk. You must push yourselves to be critical, utilizing the templates of the past to create new paradigms for analyzing the incarnation and its implication for making your body matter wherever you are. In other words, at my time here, my friends, Kermit included, that we made a pact to never just be passive members in any class we were. We pushed professors to deal with the implications that our bodies were in their space. And so if a reading did not necessarily relate to our experience, we would meet with them, we would press them in the class to make sure they at least considered it. I'm mindful of the first essay that dropped here when I was a student. I think it was God is Black and many white students were upset with the ontological claim and so many of our Presbyterian friends got upset at this. But it provided us a foray into understanding how scholarship itself shapes our ethical and moral concerns. Like perks like Paris and Wes and Moden and others have exclaimed, to truly uphold the ethic of exclus inclusiveness and to esteem the integrity of, God's, of all of God's creation, black studies should not be peripheral to, but rather central within any theological curriculum. The most progressive professors you see across this country nowadays quickly look to powerful studies, as they should in Latin America, but we still fail to see a centering of black studies. No other peoples on this earth can teach you more about what it means to struggle for the basic human dignity and meaning than those of African descent. And so for African American students training for the future, we must insist where possible to find ways to augment whatever we consider to be classical theological education within our cantons, our canons. We can't just reside with scholars, but also in our communities as well. And so like myself, many other scholars you may encounter from communities of difference are wrestling with pedagogies that are outside of the norm. What does it mean for us to teach, not just in PowerPoint or in lecture format, but what kind of study can emerge outside of the classroom? My argument to you tonight is that Paris deserves a rereading, not just from you, but you should maybe profess those in your precepts that they reread them as well. Because it's only in hindsight that I've come to discover or recognize the power of his dialogical proposal. My friends and I can tell you I didn't take many courses in practical theology while I was here. I was already an ordained Baptist minister, and so many of the theology of the church and the church mothers had given me what I thought I needed. But it was while I was here with the first time I ever read or heard of Audre Lorde, the first time I read Souls of Black Folk. Being an engineering major, I didn't come across these kinds of texts. And it would transform me. Paris, at the time, was running a joint program in African American Studies, I think, between the seminary and Princeton University. And I was fortunate at the time to have access to folks like Eddie Glaude and Cornell West, Melissa Harris Perry, a cadre of us who was here at the time that enabled me to stretch my curricula. Now, I didn't know what I was studying, but I signed up to study pragmatism. Studied Peirce and James and all these folks, and it didn't much make sense to me then, but it would inform my thinking a bit later on. I also would encounter other religious thinkers like Erasmus of Rotterdam. I would also en engage with other folks as well. And what this did for me was have me to recognize and push that there is a deeper learning about religious struggle outside of what I typically got in theological studies. Yet I argue that we need not, need not only this dialogical model, this exchange between theological study and humanities and social sciences, but we need a triangular one that includes not only the seminary and the university, but a community of folk, a community of pastors, of activists, and artists, of business leaders, to form communities of care, if not communities of coalition. It is only in this complicated work of disrupting the status quo that we can produce, that is, imagine, dream, and write knowledge together. It's not just collaboration, but intimacy, entanglement, a different orientation to work beyond the walls that we have become used to. Paris makes a second point in this essay that's worth doing. He moves on to then compare um, 
the two types of theology and functions of the black church in the past. In my own thinking, I've thought to update this more. So let me go back to this ambiguous relationship a little bit while. Why is there a need to have struggle to overcome the story of Paris next in his discussion um, talks about two modes in which these churches exist. On the one pole, the black church is always engaged in survivalist assimilationist type of orientations. And on the other one, there have always been the politics of protests or liberation type of struggle. And in my own engagement at work, I think before we can move to think about coalition work or collaboration with those whom we, those whom we, we might share faith perspectives, it's helpful to reframe our understandings of these basic struggles. And in my own scholarship, I've sought to do this by re-looking at the history of this kind of engagement. And so I'll move here now to some of my slides. Part of my work uh, situates, the, situates black Protestants within a larger struggle for African-American identity. I theorize, in short, that religious struggle, black religious struggle in this country has always been tied up with representation, with cultural representation. In other words, it is a struggle for identity. If we can bracket our concerns with rituals and belief and creeds, at bottom, we all grapple within our own tradition to recognize a sense of self-definition uh, and belonging. And so black Protestant formations are powerful illuminations of what I consider to be the core struggle of black responses to what I theorize are black social death. Again, I borrow this theory from a range of other folks. But in short, they are products of a shared modernity founded upon the sociological catastrophe, the transatlantic slave trade, and its afterlife in what I refer to as settler colonialism, this ongoing uh, depossession by powerful groups in our cities and urban areas today that affects not only black Americans, but other indigenous communities as well. Within this study, I situate black Protestants among other groups I compare. I compare them with black activists and artists, but I also compare them with black Greek life members using theories like Durkheim and others. We talk about civil religion and Berger. I talk about religion really being an eminently sociological thing. Again, in my project, I'm bracketing theological belief here I'm saying, at bottom, what can we think about when we think about black religious struggle? But there are some historical facts we should not overlook. One, um, that 53% of all African Americans today identify as being black Protestant in some kind of way. Um, there are seven historically black Protestant denominations. Of course, there are the Methodists, uh, there are the Baptists, and then there are the Pentecostals. Uh, we can talk about that later if you're interested. But 40% of all black Protestants identify as Baptists. We can't negate the fact that this high type of affiliation is related to a type of enslavement and also building in this country. But what I found is that there have been stat standard narratives of homogeneity when it comes to looking at black Protestants, meaning uh, in many ways, many of us consider black Protestants to be part of a larger fundamentalist type of movement, but you'll see within black churches that there are a range of folk struggling for meaning there. And the content of their beliefs may not be think what you've seen. For instance, we see now this great backlash going on around white evangelicalism and their pronouncements about women preachers and Beth Moore and all this stuff going on. But what you'll find is that black Protestants are a unique set of, of evangelicalism belief that needs to be teased out. So I do some of that work in my own work. But also, when thinking about Paris and my own analysis of social death and Afro-Protestant life, I think about the struggle of a black Protestants to really uh, acquire a type of life amidst this death. I cite uh, the statistics about how black, about black crime rates, about black housing, about all these things to establish the veritable fact that indeed to be black in this country means that you are dealt with a death-dealing hand from the beginning. But I also wanted to re-narrate this struggle I talk about. What does it mean to struggle for identity? You can directly account for the overrepresentation of blacks who are part of the Protestant denominations due to the early Christian formation in slavery during the 18th and 19th century. This great type of burgeoning uh, movement to Christianize a whole bunch of blacks for several reasons. There are two 
causal factors for this. On the one hand, uh, there was this growing type of pietistic evangelism uh, that came from this great pietism movement over across the country, and so this evangelical fervor took place, the great camp meetings of the Methodists, and usually around the first, some during the first, but mostly the second uh, great wave of the awakenings where you see a whole swath of blacks convert to Christianity, along with a lot of poor whites. And so this accounts for a type of meaning here. But this is just only one causal factor. Yes, there's a religious fervor of world, but you can't also disconnect this from the capitalistic interests of those who were in power in this country. And so many sociologists uh, have thought about this a while, but we see what Paris talks about in this tussle, this type of protest activity versus this type of survivalist kind of strand. And during slave religion, you've heard about it, right? There were these stealing away to have these different services away from the services of their master. But this was not the norm. Whenever black Christians typically were in these interracial congregations, historians like Bowles, for instance, talk about, look, in the beginning, uh, there were plenty of interracial congregations. That is true, because under slavery during the 18th century, we didn't have a choice but to worship with some of y'all, right? Um, but those were different kind of circumstances. And the, so those theorists who think about, historians who think about slave religion, are thinking about a different kind of expression that was a synchronistic type of form of religion. Yes, with African religion, but sometimes with different forms that were not Christian whatsoever. But they formed their own cultural type of ethos. And what they were trying to do was form a sense of identity, a sense of belonging within a large society that had come to take this Christian banner. At the same time, when Puritan colonists were beginning to establish their own identity away from the mother Europe and the British, black folks would also appeal to this same strand. We are also struggling under the banner of God as well to establish our own sense of dignity and self-worth self as well. You saw in the 1830s, for instance, no less than three famous rebellions, right? Nat Turner, uh, Denmark, Vesey, all these folks began to read scripture for themselves and interpret it in other ways, but wanted to express something else. There was something within them that said, no, there's something not right with this existence, and we have our own Christianity that says there's something uh, should be different. Now, even during these own times, there was great independent black church movements happening. Some of them were started by whites who didn't want blacks to worship with them, so they funded many of these efforts, right? But also you would see, I think the first congregation in the 1700s, somewhere in Virginia somewhere, that blacks established independent churches on their own. And what I'm arguing is that more so than just the content of belief, this was a cultural struggle for a type of meaning and identity uh, that was imposed upon them by a type of master narrative that said to be decent, to be human, in this society mean to be Christian. We see some of these same tropes being used uh, today by Folks in elective positions. Every election cycle, there is the belief in God thrown out whether they believe or not. Because symbolically, this does something and has done something throughout this country. I move then from there, though, to talk about black formations, black Protestant formations, as a type of American social rebirth in this country. We saw it laudingly in the great efforts of Martin Luther King, who was able to do two things, combine a liberal theological education with a civil religious rhetoric about belonging and about uh, the need to all citizens to be equally and press for these things. Paris compares these two survivalists and also protest efforts in his essay to say something else, to say that, listen, when we think about theology or black womanist and black liberation theology, these are type of prophetic movements, but they also relate to a type of prophetic activity that's always happened amongst black Christians. Black Christians have always pressed against the status quo. They've done so, however, within the meaning arrangements that they were given, right? So before, those of us who went on to seminary and started studying this stuff, we didn't know anything about James and all these other folk in Baldwin. All we knew was what Mama and them taught us to go to the church on the corner. All I knew is what Maury Duffy used to lay our hands on me and say, boy, you don't have much sense, but if you just stay with God, you might be all right, right? These kind of tropes would continue to help us throughout. One second, let me get back to my point here. So the two functions and theologies of churches today, how do they compare to the fast? They still are mostly survivalist and protest 
efforts in magic. Kermit mentioned my own association with St. John's United Methodist uh, in Houston, Texas. That was one of the few two progressive pastor, pastors Juanita Rasmus and Rudy Rasmus, who were able to, as best as they can, strain with this new movement of activities, this new era of black consciousness that wants to not only center LGBTQ voices, black women, but they wrestle with it in thick and robust ways. This is not the first time. Since the late 90s and 80s, though, however, they have been an affirming congregation. We also see congregations in Chicago, like Otis Moss Jr., other churches that are a part of the liberationist type struggle. But by and large, you also still see a lot of churches that are about survival and accommodation. What does it mean to provide people meaning amidst their oppressive circumstances? Here is where Paris talks about the dialogical model again. Let me see how we're doing on time. Oh, wow. I'm going to wrap this up quickly. Actually, let me just skip this point. So he, rec he, he recommends a dialogical model, meaning U.S. seminary students should engage not only with the university as well, to figure out ways to think about how to employ your training in your models of ministry when you leave this place, training in law and politics, or training with other folk. You may not feel comfortable going across the street or establishing these programs, but you also have a lot to teach them as well. No other persons think about normative questions about meaning and existence than you. And so you have a lot to offer these students in these other spaces as well. What I recommend is this triangular model, which I briefly mean by that is not only should the university and seminary combine, but we should make sure that our theological uh, training happens within the context of communities outside of our churches and our educational institution. What does it mean for me to develop and learn a language of how to speak to somebody who doesn't use the same type of metaphor as I use? So if I say praise the Lord, they look at me crazy. I'm like, what do you mean by that, right? How can we develop new vocabularies given this post postmodern moment? Here is where justice, solidarity, and innovation come together. In my own life, I tried to struggle this out, and this is where Project Curate emerged. Uh, I have another friend in the audience with us today, Reverend Dr. Matthew Russell, and he brought me back to theological thinking. Just like I was concerned about black freedom and religion, he was very much concerned about theology and the struggle for social justice. And through this, we began developing a unique paradigm where divinity school students, PhD students, artists, and activists come into another social space that we create where no one perspective is esteemed over the other. Communities are then forced to grapple with language while esteeming the difference of others. Like one of my other mentors says to me, difference should not be a problem we think we need to solve, but rather something that we should wrestle with so that we can appreciate that in our lives. Here is just about radical imagination here. What does it mean for you as theological students to not just think differently, but to force and press your way into strategies and methods of creating a ministry that can matter? For me, it's about black matters, yes, but it's also about black matter. My black body moving through space and times carries meaning that most theologians, theologians may not think of. And the challenge to each of you today is to also think of the ways that your body matters. If we look to Jesus as a divine figure, Jesus had a real body. That comes with color implications. It comes with practical ministry struggles. And so I leave you today with thinking about that. How should we structure our theological education for the future? Thank you for your time.